Bonjour à tous. Today is an important day as we are marking the fifth anniversary of the Paris Climate Agreement. On December 12, 2015, nations came together and committed to reduce emissions in order to limit climate change. Unfortunately, the US formally withdrew from the agreement on 4th of November 2020. But President-elect Joe Biden announced the US would soon rejoin the agreement again. In this context, we thought it would make sense to have a short conversation on climate change, especially in California, discussing the uh, effects of climate change and actions taken by government and by private co corporations. To do so, we gathered experts uh, of the academic world, from government and from a, from a private company. Um, first, allow me to uh, introduce Sebastian. Hello, bonjour. I'm a scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in Berkeley, California, where I lead the climate science department. And I work on projects from uh, the Department of Energy and the California Energy Commission on carbon cycle in general, and more specifically on the impact of uh, climate change on natural ecosystem and quantification of greenhouse gases emissions. Great. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, we also have with us uh, Kate Gordon from uh, the Governor's uh, Planning and Research Office. Kate. Hello, bonjour. It's so nice to see or be with you all. Um, I am the Director of the Governor's Office of, of uh, Planning and Research, which is a cabinet level department in the state of California. We advise the Governor and the rest of the cabinet on long range solutions, including to climate risk and resilience land use and planning and sustainable economic development. So many, many intersections with the issues we're going to talk about here. I'm also the governor's senior advisor on climate change. Great, thank you so much, Kate, for being with us. And then we have uh, Emmanuel uh, from Google. Emmanuel Soquet. Bonjour, I'm Emmanuel Soquet and I'm a vice president at Google. I lead a team called GTEC, which helps Google customers get the most out of our many Google products Uh, by providing them with support. We also power Google's product by delivering operational and technical services at an unprecedented scale. Happy to be here. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. So maybe we should start the, this discussion right away. Uh, we'll start with uh, Sebastian, maybe to get a, a clearer picture of what we're talking about when we discuss uh, uh, climate change in California. The uh, World Meteorological Organization has indicated that 2020 has been globally one of the hottest years in history for the planet. Is that actually also true for California? And what are the other effects that we see regarding climate change in California? I mean, as you I just said, uh, global temperature soared in this fall, uh, making November the hottest months ever recorded. And unless uh, December's uh, temperature dips dramatically global, uh, you know, globally, the year to 2020 could overtake 2016 as the hottest year on record. Uh, closely followed by 2019, 2015, 2016. And actually, uh, if you want to go there, I mean, the past six years have been the hottest six years on records and warming is expected to continue, right? So this uh, temperature change is affecting California in several ways. The one that um, I'm going to mention, which, which comes to my mind first, is associated with the risk of wildfires that is severely increasing in California. The scale of wildfires and the lens of the wildfire season, quote unquote, has been growing uh, with 75% of California 20th largest wildfires occurring since 20, uh, 2000. And actually five of the California six largest fires on record have occurred in 2020, this year. Higher temperatures and drought increase the severity, frequency, and extent of those wildfires, which harm you know, property, livelihoods, and uh, human health, as we saw during the dramatic 2020 fire season. Uh, if we can still talk about fire season anymore, because uh, which usually you know used to peak between May and October, and now we are experiencing fires even in early December in Southern California. So uh, climate change is not just a projection in a distant future anymore, but rather a reality in our daily lives. I see. So it's getting warmer. It's uh, the fire season is extending. What else can we expect in the in the coming period? So I mean, we can uh, think about um, the management of water resources that is getting more challenging in California. As the climate warm, the seasonality of precipitation is shifting, less in the fall, more in winter time, less pre precipitation falling as uh, snow and more as rain, which increase both the frequency and magnitude of flooding and diminish uh, water reserves in the Sierra snowpack. 
a decrease in the snowpack reduced the water availability. Uh, soil are likely to be drier, and periods without rains are likely to become longer, making droughts even more severe. I want to remind you that during the period of 2011 to 2015, we had the driest uh, period of, on record since the record began in 1895. And in 2014, the uh, Governor Brown, who was the governor at the time, declared a statewide drought emergency, asking California to reduce their water usage by 25%. A channel, of course, that was met by my fellow Californian, which is great and give me optimism in the future. But that's another way that uh, we're seeing uh, indicators of change in California. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for that uh, overview. Uh, Kate, uh, uh, Sebastian mentioned uh, some of the challenges uh, uh, we're facing. Now, how is the, the, the government of California addressing this? Uh, I know that uh, we all witnessed that Governor Newsom is very outspoken on the uh, uh, climate issue. He's been very active, especially with his very long fire season and the measures. Uh, he did announce some measures. Can you tell us a, a little bit what, what the... Uh, uh, how California has acted so far, and to what extent do you expect these measures to be uh, efficient? Kate. Absolutely. So we are um, in California, Sebastian said, building on a, ver a very impressive and ambitious record from Governor Jerry Brown, who, as, as many know in the international uh, community, was, was really a global leader on setting goals um, and ambitions for the state. We are now very much in the mode of implementation and action. And Governor Newsom is really taking an integrated approach, looking at not only bringing down emissions through mitigation, but also a strong focus on climate resilience, which is necessary given the current state of our climate impacts, as well as on carbon removal as part of the conversation, a necessary piece of our long-term puzzle. Um, I would say that uh, what we've done, what he's done is to focus in on key areas where we must make immediate progress because we frankly are not meeting our goals. Transportation is the first of those. Uh, transportation is 51% of our emissions in California. That's in part because we do produce oil and gas. So we are an oil and gas producer and refiner along with a major user of fuel. We have 26 million passenger cars in California. So we, um, we are, uh, uh, transportation is a big piece of the puzzle. The governor recently announced an executive order committing to all new zero emission vehicle sales by 2035 and the passenger fleet and uh, uh, 2045 in, in medium and heavy duty. But along with that, and I think this is important, committed to um, developing a just transition roadmap to really look at the transition issues that are inherent in that kind of a large scale tra uh, trans transformation of that system. Um, he's also recently, another area we need to make more progress is on natural and working lands. Uh, many may not know that California has 40 million people who live on old, only 6% of our land mass. The rest of our land is, much of it is federal, a lot of it is agricultural, a lot of forest land. The land has got to be part of our climate solution, as the IPCC has said. And so we have also committed to conserving 30% of our land and coastal waters um, by 2030 to make sure that they're acting as a carbon sink, promoting resilience and promoting biodiversity. I'll just say a couple more things on this. Um, I think that integrated approach really requires a lot of balancing. And, and something Sebastian said, he pointed, I think, rightly to the number of increased climate events we're having. That requires an enormous effort on our part, to your question on efficiency, to balance the budget that we're putting into emergency response and the safety net um, and the social programs that are around those impacts with the budget that we need to put into climate resilience over the long-term and ultimately into mitigation. We are starting to see real challenges in doing that. We spent a billion dollars on firefighting this year, just as an example. And I think other jurisdictions are having exactly the same challenges of how to get to that balance really points to the need to focus on resilience and not just emergency response. Thank you so much for these uh, very interesting uh, insights, uh, Kate. Um, so, uh, as you said, uh, California has faced these terrible challenges in the past years and past months. Um, maybe some other regions of the U.S. haven't been as affected as, as much. Um, do you think it would be easy to, to and, and as we know, we won't be efficient of cli on climate change if, uh, if only some of us uh, jump in and, and act. Do you think uh, at the federal level it will be easy uh, to uh, be as ambitious as California is being? Will it be easy to convey all these uh, uh, concerns that you have and to actually act at the federal level? 
I think we know, um, all of us who work on this issue, that climate impacts and solutions are pretty much inherently regional. We're all looking from, we're working from different economies, different skill sets, different assets, different approaches, um, and different climates, frankly. So uh, while California has had a significant number of fires, floods, all the things that you heard, other parts of the US um, have as well, have had different but very um, dire uh, consequences as well. I think there's a great opportunity, of course, rejoining Paris sent a really important signal from our national government um, that uh, we are committed to a policy direction and to be part of the international conversation. But I also think that we can expect early, um, early progress from a Biden administration on setting some of the, the financing mechanisms, the operational mechanisms that will actually incorporate these climate risks into our decision making, climate opportunity into our decision making. How do we, uh, one thing he's doing is to put uh, climate smart people into every one of the agencies as, as secretaries. That means that our decisions in treasury will be taken with, a, with, a, with an eye toward um, climate risk as a financial risk, for instance. Um, it means that we'll be looking at our economic recovery and stimulus with an eye toward the transition to carbon neutrality and to net zero. I think Europe has, has really shown the way on some of this with the Green Deal um, in terms of taking an operational approach. We're really uh, looking there and also saying, look, every part of the United States is having similar challenges to California in terms of balancing these responses to these impacts, balancing our need to look forward to opportunities. And I think we can expect the federal government to be putting in place some structures that really make it possible for us all to continue leading in the way that we, uh, we need to individually. Great. Well, um, thank you for this uh, optimistic note. Uh, I turn to uh, Emmanuel Soquet. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, uh, you're from Google, which is uh, obviously a, a very known uh, corporation for innovation. But to what extent uh, uh, does Google actually uh, um, act uh, regarding these challenges that we, that we just mentioned? Thanks for the question. Um, sustainability has really been a core value for Google uh, since we were founded 20 years ago. Uh, we were the first major company to become carbon neutral in 2007. Uh, we were the first major company to match our energy use with 100% renewable energy in 2017. Uh, we operate the cleanest, most efficient global cloud in the industry. And we also are the world's largest corporate buyer of renewable energy. Uh, in our third decade of climate action now, uh, we're going even further to help build a carbon-free future for everyone. By 2030, uh, Google is aiming to run our business on carbon-free energy everywhere at all times. This is our biggest sustainability moonshot yet, with enormous practical and technical complexity. We are the first major companies that set out to do this, and we aim to be the first one to achieve it. And we are not stopping at our own operations. We are also supporting our partners and users to enable a carbon-free future for everyone. We are committed to helping at least 500 cities to reduce one gigaton of emission by 2030. We have also pledged to offer a billion people new ways of taking sustainable actions by 2022 through our core products. Those are the kind of really audacious goals that make me very excited and proud to work at Google. Um, there is a lot of work to do, though. Thank you. So you mentioned, Emmanuel, that you that you will be relying uh, uh, only on at some point on on carbon uh, uh, free energy. How how can you actually ensure that uh, the energy that you probably purchase uh, uh, that that will be only clean energy? So getting to our goal of being carbon free is not going to be easy. Uh, we're going to need the help of partners from the technology developers to electricity provider, policymakers, and regulators to be successful. To achieve that goal, uh, first, we'll continue purchasing clean energy on every grid where we operate, and we're going to expand our purchasing effort to technologies or combinations that can match our consumption with clean energy on an hourly per hourly basis. Uh, we'll need new technologies. So we're going to catalyze the development and commercialization of new tech that we and the world will need to fully decarbonize electricity and continue to develop those solutions to meet supply and demand of clean energy. Uh, we are going to work and develop and advocate for policy change needed to decarbonize the world electricity system. And again, we are going to need the help of everybody to be successful. 
we are confident that by working together, we can pave the way for carbon-free electricity system for all. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for this. I think this discussion has really shown that uh, there is a, a mobilization of the academic world, a mobilization, obviously, of government, and a mobilization, which is good news also, of uh, companies, including global companies, on this uh, global issue. Um, we know that we need to act uh, swiftly. The uh, intention of the US to rejoin the Paris Agreement is very good news. Uh, and now we all need to abide by our commitments and make sure that we can uh, uh, flatten this curve, uh, the one of, uh, of uh, uh, temperature change. Thank you so much to all uh, for being part in this discussion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much.